So in the previous two modules, the first two modules of this unit on consumer choice, we focused on the sensitivity of consumers to a change in the price of the good by looking at the price elasticity of demand. And when we do that, we are asking the question, how much does demand change when there is a change in price? Does it change by a big amount or a little amount? And that is what we are calculating when we look at the price elasticity of demand. So that's what we did in modules 46 and 47. Now in module 48, we focus on other important elasticities. Elasticities that measure our sensitivity to other factors that change besides the price of a good. In this one, we'll look at how our sensitivity to a change in the price of one good affects our demand for another good that may be related to it, such as a complement or a substitute. We'll also look at how our, by how much our demand for a good changes in response to a change in our income. And then finally, we'll see that producers or suppliers can also be sensitive to a change in price, and they can increase or decrease their supply of a good by a lot or a little based on a change in price, and that's called the price elasticity of supply. So we'll look at all of these in this module. So what are we going to learn? Well, we're going to measure the responsiveness of demand, as I said, for one good to changes in the price of another good. That's called the cross-price elasticity of demand. We'll also measure the responsiveness of demand to changes in income, using the income elasticity of demand. And then we'll look and explain the significance of the price elasticity of supply, which, like the price elasticity of demand, measures the responsiveness of the quantity supplied this time to changes in price. And we'll identify and describe the factors that influence the size of these various elasticities. Now, economists, governments, and firms are quite interested in how responsive one variable is to a change in another variable. For example, suppose the price of gasoline were to increase. The producers of large trucks and SUVs will be very interested to know how this might affect sales of these vehicles. A cross-price elasticity of demand would be used to measure this response. But suppose the economy is suffering a recession and personal incomes are lower. The airline and hotel industries would be interested to know how this would affect the demand for air travel and hotel rooms. An income elasticity of demand would be used in this case. On the supply side of the market, Producers would like to increase output if the price of their goods was to rise. A price elasticity of supply would be useful in measuring this response. So let's start with the first of these three, which is called the cross-price elasticity of demand. The cross-price elasticity of demand between two goods measures the effect of the change in one good's price on the quantity demanded of the other good. It is equal to to the percent change in the quantity demanded of one good divided by the percent change in the other good's price. Or, as the formula on this slide suggests, the percent change in the quantity of good A divided by the percent change in the price of good B. So this is how it differs from the price elasticity of demand, because when we looked at price elasticity of demand, we were looking at the percent change in the quantity of demanded of good A relative to the percent change in the price of good A. But now we're looking at the percent change in quantity demanded of good A relative to the price percent change in the price of another good called good B. And that's why we call this the cross-price elasticity of demand. It refers to the effect of a change in a product's price on the quantity demanded for another different product. Now, remember that the demand for good A shifts when the price of a related good changes. We learned that earlier when we looked at shifts of the demand curve in the last unit. This elasticity measures how much that demand curve shifts. So numerically, the formula is shown for products A and B in the formula on this slide. The percent change in quantity demanded of good A divided by the percent change in the price of good B. So, what does this tell us? It tells us, number one, are goods related to each other? 
Remember, goods can be related to each other either as substitutes for each other, which means they replace each other, or they can be related as complements for each other, which means they are bought together, they go together. Goods can also be unrelated to each other. So if they are related to each other, they are either substitutes or complements, and the cross-price elasticity of demand can be used to tell us which of these is actually true. So if we calculate the cross-price elasticity of demand and the value we get is positive, then it tells us that good A and good B are substitutes for each other. For example, the formula that I've given you in this slide. The, if the price of Nike shoes increases by 2% and the quantity demanded for Converse shoes increases by 4%, then we would take the, um, the quantity demanded of Converse shoes and the change in that, which is 4%, that would be our numerator, divided by the percent change in the price of the other good, Nike shoes, which is 2%, and we would get a value of 2. Now remember, when we looked at price elasticity of demand, we said the value is always going to be negative, so we drop the negative sign and we take the absolute value of the number. When we're looking at cross-price elasticity of demand, the the uh, value of the good matters. In other words, if the sign is positive or negative, that matters to us. In this case, the value is positive, so we know that they are substitutes for each other. Now, in the second example, if cross-price elasticity is negative in its value, then it tells us that good A and good B are complements for each other. So the example I've given you here deals with the price of gasoline. If the price of gasoline increases by 20% and the quantity demanded for large SUVs decreases by 5%, then our formula is negative 5% divided by 20%. Well, that gives us a negative value, an elasticity coefficient of negative 0.25. In this case, we care about the value. It's negative, and therefore it tells us that these two goods are complements for each other. So when we measure the cross-price elasticity of demand, we care about whether the value is positive or negative. If it's a positive number, it tells us the goods are substitutes for each other. If the value is negative, it tells us they are complements of each other. Now, if the cross, price, if the cross elasticity is zero, then it tells us that good A and B are not related to each other. They're not substitutes. They're not complements. They're completely unrelated to each other. That's if the cross-price elasticity is zero. And then that tells us that they are independent products. So, for example, if the price of breakfast cereal increased, there would likely be no impact on the quantity of denim jeans demanded because breakfast cereal and denim jeans are, as far as we know, unrelated to each other. So, see if you can think of a, of a list of pairings that likely have positive, negative, and zero cross-price elasticity measures. The next type of elasticity that we will look at is the income elasticity of demand. The income elasticity of demand is the percent change in the quantity of a good demanded when a consumer's income changes divided by the percent change in the consumer's income and it's measured numerically by this formula. The percent change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in income rather than by the percent change in price. So remember that the demand for good X shifts, we learned that in the last unit, when the income of the consumer changes. So we already know that based on the law of demand but this elasticity measures by how much that demand changes when there is a change in a consumer's income. So what are we looking for here? Well, again, here we are looking at whether or not the sign is positive or negative. A positive income elasticity of demand indicates that the good is a normal good, because remember, when we look at income, 
shifting the demand curve, we said it can tell us if a good is a normal good or an inferior good. Goods are normal goods if demand increases when income increases. Goods are inferior goods if demand decreases when income increases. And so by measuring the income elasticity of demand, it can tell us whether a good is actually a normal good or an inferior good. So let's look at a few examples of this. If American consumer income falls by 2% and the quantity of flights to Europe declines by 8%, then the income elasticity of demand is equal to 8% divided by 2%, and that gives us a value of 4. This example demonstrates an income elastic response, and this is true of most goods that are considered luxuries. Another example would be that consumer income rises by 4% and the quantity of fresh vegetables purchased increases by 1%. The income elasticity there is 1% divided by 4% and that's equal to 0.25. This example demonstrates an income el elastic response that is fairly typical for food and other necessities. So, if the value is for income elasticity of demand is positive, it tells us that the good is a normal good. If it's a large number, it tells us the good is probably a luxury good. If it's a smaller number, it tells us that the good is likely seen as being more of a necessity than a luxury. Now, when the income elasticity of demand turns out to be a negative number, this tells us that the good is an inferior good. So, for example, if consumer income falls by 5% and consumers increase their consumption of spam by 4%, then the income elasticity of demand is equal to 4% divided by negative 5%. And that gives us a negative value of negative 0.80. So, at the height of the most recent economic recession, stronger sales of spam were responsible for a very profitable quarter for the Hormel company that produces spam. So if the value is negative for income elasticity of demand, it tells us that the good is an inferior good. So with both cross-price elasticity of demand and income elasticity of demand, we don't drop the negative side. We care about the value of the number. Whether it's positive or negative tells us something about that good. In the case of cross-price elasticity of demand, the value, whether it's positive or negative, tells us whether the good is a complement or a substitute or unrelated. With income elasticity of demand, it tells us whether the good is a normal good or an inferior good. And if it's a normal good, the size or magnitude of the number tells us whether the good is a necessity or a luxury. So there is a lot that we can learn from these different elasticities. Now you might be th saying, well, what if it's an inferior good? Well, with an inferior good, there really is no distinction between a luxury and a necessity, right? Because if a good is inferior, people don't really consider it to be something they want, so they're not going to consider it to be a luxury. Now, here's a case of, you know, the loss of farming in the United States. It used to be that the United States was largely an agricultural nation, and many people were into family farming. But in the last few decades and even the last century, many people have given up their family farms and th those have gone away. Well, the income elasticity of demand for food is much less than one. So food is what we call income inelastic. Well, competition among farmers means that with progress in technology, this has led to lower food prices. So meanwhile, the demand for food is price inelastic. So falling prices of agricultural goods, other things equal, reduces the total revenue of farmers. And that has pushed many farmers then, losing that revenue, out of the agricultural business. So progress in farming has been good for consumers, but it has been bad for farmers in America. The last elasticity that we will look at is the price elasticity of supply. The concept of price elasticity also applies to the supply of a good. 
because producers and suppliers of goods are affected as well. Now, in the prior unit, we learned that the law of supply says that when the price of a good increases, firms will increase quantity supplied of that good. But economists would like to measure by how much does quantity increase or decrease in response to a change in price. Price elasticity of supply is a measure of the responsiveness of the quantity of a good supplied to the price of that good. And, numerically, the elasticity formula is the same as that for demand, except that we substitute the word supplied for the word demanded everywhere in the formula. So the price elasticity of supplied is equal to the percent change in quantity supplied divided by the percent change in price. And, just like with demand, the same elastic and inelastic distinctions are made. Now, because price and quantity supplied move in the same direction, the value that we get will always be a positive number. And the values are the same. If elasticity of supply is greater than 1, supply is considered elastic. If elasticity of supply is equal to 1, it's considered unit elastic. And if elasticity of supply is less than 1, supply is considered inelastic. The figure below shows a perfectly inelastic supply curve. It's perfectly vertical. It looks like an I, the letter I. And that's how you can remember that a perfectly inelastic demand curve and a perfectly inelastic supply curve are both vertical because they look like a capital I. And if you think of it, it makes sense, right? Because a perfectly inelastic supply curve, as the price goes up from $2,000 to $3,000 in this example, the quantity of cell phone frequencies stays the same at 100. It doesn't increase, nor does it decrease. Quantity supplied is unchanged. And if you think about that, that's because the number of cell phone frequencies is limited. And there's nothing we can do to increase their frequency. So no matter by how much the price of a cell phone frequency goes up, the quantity supplied will not rise or fall. When we have a perfectly inelastic supply curve or a perfectly inelastic demand curve, we say that elasticity of supply is equal to zero, just like elasticity of demand was equal to zero with that number. So the smallest number that elasticity of supply or demand can be is zero. And that's perfectly inelastic. Any number between zero and one will be inelastic. The greater the, greater the number, the less inelastic the supply. The closer the value is to zero, the more inelastic the supply is. Now, in, on the right-hand side of the screen, we see the opposite example a perfectly elastic supply curve, which is perfectly vertical, or, excuse me, perfectly horizontal. This is the same as a perfectly elastic demand curve. That was also horizontal. But instead of being equal to zero, we say it is equal to infinity. Because at any price above $12, the quantity supplied would be infinite. Because at exactly $12, producers will produce any quantity that we want. And at any price below $12, the quantity supplied will be zero. This is the opposite of what it was with demand. Remember, at any price above $12, demand would have fallen to zero. But at any price below $12, quantity demanded would have been equal to infinity. So with a perfectly horizontal supply curve or a perfectly horizontal demand curve, we say it is perfectly elastic and it's equal to infinity. So the flatter the supply curve, the more elastic the supply. The more vertical the supply curve, the more inelastic the supply. And that is the same as it was with a demand curve. So supply curves can be anywhere between perfectly horizontal all the way to perfectly vertical. Just like demand curves could be perfectly horizontal all the way to perfectly vertical. The, the flatter the curve, the more elastic the supply or demand. The more vertical the curve, 
the more inelastic the supply or the demand. And so the value can be anywhere between zero and infinity. Those are the extreme cases. Most elasticities for both demand and supply fall somewhere between zero and infinity. And remember, if it's between zero and one, it's inelastic. If it's greater than one, it's elastic. Those same numbers apply. So there is perfectly inelastic supply when the price elasticity of supply is zero. A vertical supply curve, like the one we saw in the, perfect, in the previous screen, implies that even at the highest of prices, there is something that prevents firms from increasing the quantity that they supply. This might be a technological limitation, or in the case of agriculture, a seasonal impossibility. So when the price elasticity of supply is zero, that means that changes in the price of the good have no effect on the quantity supplied. And a perfectly inelastic supply curve is a vertical line. Now, there is a perfectly elastic supply when even a tiny increase or reduction in the price will lead to a very large change in the quantity supplied so that the price elasticity of supply is infinite. And the elastic, perfectly elastic supply curve is a horizontal line. That implies that even the smallest increase in the price would dramatically increase quantity supplied, and a small decrease in the price would de decrease quantity supplied to zero. So what factors determine the price elasticity of supply? Well, just like there were factors and reasons to determine why some goods are more inelastic and other goods are more elastic, there are factors that determine whether some goods are more inelastic in supply or more elastic in supply. Because sometimes when there is a price change, it is easy for producers to increase or decrease supply in response to a change in price. And when that happens, then the supply is going to be more elastic. Other times, it's more difficult for suppliers to respond quickly to increase or decrease supply. And in those cases, supply will be more inelastic. There are two primary reasons that explain this. One is the availability of inputs. What are inputs? Remember, inputs are the things used to make goods and services, land, labor, and capital, raw materials, workers, and capital goods. So the question is, well, how easy and quickly and cheaply can suppliers get more land, labor, and capital, get more inputs to be able to produce more goods and services? If they can get these things quickly and easily and cheaply, then they can increase supply quickly and it will be elastic. If they can't, if it's not easy or it's not cheap to do so, then supply will be more inelastic. So the price elasticity of supply tends to be large when inputs are readily available and can be shifted into and out of production at a relatively low cost. It tends to be small when inputs are difficult or expensive to obtain. So if a firm can get these inputs, labor, capital, raw materials, into and out of production quickly, the elasticity of supply will be more elastic. The second thing that can affect it is the time period involved. The time period involved is very important in elasticity of supply. The price elasticity of supply tends to grow larger as producers have more time to respond to a price change. This means that the long-run price elasticity of supply is often higher than the short-run elasticity. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, there are different time periods that we can talk about when it comes to supply. One time period we can refer to is what we call the market period. The market period of time is so short that supply is inelastic. It could be almost perfectly inelastic or vertical, meaning there is a time period in when it's almost impossible to increase or decrease supply. So whatever that time period is, is called the market period. And in that time period, supply is probably going to be close to, if not, perfectly inelastic. But then as more time goes on, supply can be more responsive to price changes. And this is called the short run. It's, the short run is not a specific 
period of time with a specific definition, it, the short-run supply elasticity is more elastic than the market period, and it will depend how fa on how fast the producers can respond to price changes. In the period of time we call the short run, there is not enough time to add new capital or land. Increases in output are achieved only by being able to hire more workers and adding those to fixed amounts of capital and fixed amounts of land or raw materials. So supply can be elastic, but not very much. So it's relatively inelastic. That's what we call the short run. And again, it's not defined by a specific time period. It's just the time period in which we can't change the amount of capital or raw materials to produce more goods and services. We can only change the amount of workers to do so. So it will be relatively inelastic. But then there is a time period that we refer to as the long run. And over the long run, the supply of all inputs, land, labor, and capital, can change in response to a price change. And so the long run supply elasticity is the most elastic of all, because more adjustments can be made over time and quantity can be changed more relative to a small change in price. Agriculture is a great example of the importance of time. Suppose it is July 2010 and the price of soybeans is soaring. Farmers would love to supply more soybeans at the higher price, but soybean crops have already been planted for the season. The quantity of soybeans that will be supplied at harvest 2010 was basically determined months ago during the spring planting season. So the immediate soybean supply curve is very inelastic or nearly vertical and farmers are incapable of responding to the higher price. However, if the high prices continue into early 2011, farmers will be able to plant more acres of soybeans next year and will supply more soybeans. So the increase in quantity supplied is greater as more time passes and farmers are able to respond. So what we've seen in this module is an elasticity menagerie. It means that there are many different elasticities. And so here, on these next two slides, is a table, and you may want to pause the video and copy this table into your notes, that will review the various elasticities that we have discussed in this module. We've looked at the cross-price elasticity of demand, which tells us if goods are complements, for each other, substitutes for each other, or unrelated to each other. We've looked at price elasticity of demand in the previous two modules, 46 and 47, and that's shown at the top of this slide. And those values can vary between zero and infinity. And we know that if it's between zero and one, price elasticity of demand is inelastic. If it's equal to one, it's unit elastic. If it's greater than one, it's elastic. Then we looked at income elasticity of demand, and we said, well, the value can tell us whether it's an in inferior good or a normal good. If it's a normal good, then the value will be positive. If it's an inferior good, the value would, will be negative. If the value is less than 1, it tells us that the good is probably a necessity. If it's greater than 1, it's probably viewed more of, as more of a luxury. And then we looked at the price elasticity of supply, where the value must be positive, and said that this works just like elastic, price elasticity of demand. If the value is between 0 and 1, it's inelastic. If it's equal to 1, it's unit elastic. And if it's greater than 1, it's elastic. And the values can vary between 0 and infinity. So, to summarize what we've looked at in module 38, or excuse me, module 48, other price elasticities, we looked at what we can learn from the cross price elasticity of demand and how to calculate it. We learned what we can learn from the income elasticity of demand and how to calculate it, and what we can learn from the price elasticity of supply and what we can learn from it. We've also learned 
that just like with elasticity of demand, there can be extreme cases of perfectly inelastic supply and perfectly elastic supply and what those look like graphically. And then finally, we focused on the factors that determine the price elasticity of supply. This concludes the video on Module 48, Other Elasticities.